Morena Tato, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming this morning to listen to me talk. Um, this is only my second NDF, and I have to say it's a tiny bit intimidating talking to a room full of amazing glam professionals. When up to a little over a year ago, um, I had never worked in a museum. I knew very little about how a museum worked. My career has been spent working in media, so I've worked in everything from print magazines, newspapers, online breaking news, social media, digital marketing. I even had a stint uh, moderating comments on the Daily Mail, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, and I've created content around big commercial sponsorships for big websites. So the common thread for me has been about reaching large audiences through high volume of content. So this talk is going to be a whistle-stop tour of how some of the techniques um, I've used previously in media publications can be moved into the museum setting and it's really helped shape our storytelling online over the last year and I've got loads of practical examples to show you. So let's go back, let's turn back the time to one year ago. Actually I wrote one year ago and then I realised it's more like 18 months ago but anyway. so. Our new centralised website was launched in 2000, earlier in 2016, so this focused on delivering practical information to the museum visitor, so a, very much a kind of marketing and corporate website. Everything from events, exhibitions, to where to park your car. Um, what about the digital visitor? So we have our Te Papa blog. So this is the place where our experts blog from a first person perspective about the work that they do. This blog um, existed outside the central publishing um, system. So while there was quite a lot of you know, decent traffic and a really engaged group of Te Papa bloggers using this platform, there was no editorial governance over what happened there. So they published whatever they wanted to, whenever they wanted to. We also have a bunch of other sites, so you might uh, recognise um, Squiddy there. So we've got um, Builder Squid, probably nearing the end of his life now. Uh, we had a rich media site called The Channel and a separate arts website amongst others. We also have our newly launched Collections Online website, but for the purposes of today's talk, I'm only going to be focusing in on the editorial storytelling on the website and the blog. And then not forgetting social media, so we've got um, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and these social media accounts before my time had been uh, streamlined and many ghost accounts shut down. So what was the opportunity? Well, to grow our reach, engagement and awareness of our brand through what we do best. Great storytelling, but using topical, timely editorial content in order to grow and maintain a larger audience. So this is about how do we create fit for purpose online content and not just lift content out of exhibitions and onto online as an afterthought. Okay, so having a look now at the modern newsroom, which I'm aware this is not. For newsrooms to survive, they must maintain that volume of audience that is attractive to advertisers. So that's about finding the right balance between entertaining and serious content. Fake news and clickbait aside, News organisations know how to tell stories, they know how to meet the demands of an audience and this shows through the huge share of traffic online. So while we don't have the classic audience advertiser model, we don't have those pressures associated with that, what we do have is a responsibility to open our collections and our knowledge to as many people as possible. So let's talk about analytics. Analytics is our absolute best friend. We can take a leaf out of how newsrooms uh, live and die by their analytics. By using uh, an analytics-based approach and deeply analysing all of our content that we put out, we can turn the spotlight, spotlight from our needs to our users' needs. Um, that means we can do things like double down where we see popular content emerging. Um, we can also, uh, more controversially, um, stop doing what isn't working and try to convince people why they shouldn't be pursuing that line of strategy. So for example, we noticed that on the blog, the long form style of kind of academic writing wasn't a big driver of traffic for us. Um, and we needed to tailor our content to be much more accessible, shorter, um, scannable, lots of headings, I'm sure you're familiar with all that. And this is particularly for our kind of growing mobile audience. If you're in a newsroom and you're a good 
skilled online editor you know how a story is best told it's just something that you kind of know how to do so whether it's a video an article an Instagram post or a blog it's about adapting content for different pathways so how does the user actually find your content and what is their mindset when they when they uh, find that content so I'll talk a little bit more about this so I'm just going to move on to an example here which is a little how to build bug bot video that we put out when uh, the bug lab exhibition was on in a similar way that smartphone journalism has brought reporters closer to the action are there budget lo-fi ways to tell stories? Yes, there is. Uh, I think the prolific use of smartphone content on uh, your news feed has meant that we're quite used to seeing kind of lo-fi content. It doesn't have to be made for TV quality. So this little video was so easy to put together. We really didn't need much to produce this. We just needed a pair of hands, a camera, some Sharpies, um, and some kind of canned music over top. Um, this video was really popular and it's uh, when I checked on the uh, Facebook page um, about a week ago it had 61,000 views which is pretty awesome for a little 40 second video that really didn't cost much, much to produce. So audience, let's talk about audience demand. The content team is in a really, really fortunate position. We have so much content to choose from, like too much content. How do you choose? So our access to our subject matter experts and their guardianship over our collections is really what our unique selling point is, and it sets us apart from everyone else. One of the biggest challenges has been bridging the gap between our experts and our audience demand into the digital content team. And so now I actually just want to introduce the team. We have Daniel and Rachel, put your hands up, make yourself known. Uh, we also have Kate Whitley, she's our media creator. So we're a very small but perfectly formed team and very talented and this is the work that um, this team do day in, day out, matching our audience demand with our experts and being that um, excellent kind of feedback loop in between those two groups. So one of the things we did do, which was um, some work around the blog. So we we introduced some publishing workflows. Um, this is about creating kind of a best practice environments. When we bring the two skills together, the subject matter experts and the digital content team, it's a really powerful combination of skills to help grow our audience. So while we actually don't want to lose the unique voice of the expert, we do absolutely need to apply some rigor and planning around the creation and more importantly, the promotion of content. Um, and it's always good to try and encourage a bit more of a light-hearted approach where appropriate because we know our audiences really respond and love that. Okay, so this is a brag slide. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go right ahead. So um, when I look at the stats from the last, from previous six months, from the last six months to the previous six months, this is where we're at. We've increased our website traffic by 22%. We have 244% higher search engine traffic and nearly 300% increase in social media referrals. So overall, we've grown, we've grown the traffic to our non-visitor audience. That is the content that doesn't necessarily um, rely on the physical visitor coming to the museum to be able to enjoy it. We've grown that by 175%. So just some, a, few, uh, a bit of a recap on the, on the tips previously. Make content short and accessible long form academic content was not working for us. Make sure that we're using insights to inform our program and then not everything has to be high production. So I want to get to um, uh, a very kind of important point in this presentation and that is about how we actually have grown our traffic. So search engine optimization and social media are the two pathways that we concentrate on when it comes to creating this non-visitor content. And I want to talk a, lot, a little bit about what the difference is between these two because it's a, it's a big deal and it really changes how we approach content. Social media. This is content that burns brightly for a short amount of time. It is catchy. It is new, hopefully. People love seeing new things. Uh, it's visually striking. It hopefully has a very clever sell. Um, it encourages audience participation. And the audience for this is the time killers, the people who are scrolling through their feeds, sort of mindlessly. If you at Mike's talk yesterday, he talked a lot about this in terms of people not really knowing what they're looking for, but they just want to be entertained by something. Then we have our Google traffic, which I'm sure you're all aware is an is a audience that is way more task uh, focused. So they are 
looking for a job to be done. And when we're creating content around this, we're looking at uh, our headings, our page titles, we're creating uh, friendly URLs. So it's about that audience demand. And this, the Google content is much, much more well researched. I think the social media content is really just more about kind of a gut feeling about what's going to work and what isn't. And also a little bit based on insights. So sometimes content actually does span these two things. And when it does, that is the winner. So let's have a look at the SEO growth. Um, so 244% increase to SEO. This is about, not just about researching uh, seasonal um, trends in Google AdWords and other tools, but it's about finding where the gaps are and then filling them. And I want to talk about our um, Matariki case study. So Matariki is one of, the been, one of the biggest success stories for us in terms of building an audience through Google. This, the content package that we developed in 2016 had nearly 60,000 unique page views. Um, and then this year, 2017, we did increase that by 112%. Most of this was delivered through optimizing our content. This is our, arguably our most successful page. Not arguably, it is our most successful page. This Starfax page came about because we realized that there was a global um, search demand for the keywords Masariki Starfax, but there was no page out there. There's a little bit of uh, controversy around using the word fax here. So fax, uh, technically speaking, a fact is something that has been proven, but we think that a fact in this context can just be kind of a piece of information. So we had to do a little bit of convincing um, and and it's really worthwhile kind of bending the rules a little bit sometimes because this Starfax page has been huge. So this is the increase from 2016 to 2017. And the best part about this is that we did absolutely no extra work <laughs> in 2017. So for Matariki, the, just the word Matariki, we index at number two. I think sometimes we even index at number one, but 90% um, of all the traffic to this page comes through Google. Um, and I just want to show you, uh, this is probably a little small to see down the back, but this table demonstrates the number of pages that we produce, new pages we produce for 2017. So you can see that most of the pages we developed in 2016 had huge increases in 2017. So we, we're kind of hoping that that trend will continue next year and that we'll see similar increases. So this is about doing the work, biding your time, not being impatient and just letting that kind of grow by itself. Our evergreen content is really well placed to rank in Google because we have a high volume of traffic. We have a good range of multimedia content which is designed to be consumed on mobile. And um, yeah, so this means that Google will favor our unique content. Okay, so moving on to something a little more recent. We, I just want to talk about how we can turn this sort of burn bright content into relevant evergreen content very easily. So this is our Maori Language Week Te Reo Māori activity book, which the team had a kind of hunch about the fact that this would perform very well. So they actually just kind of did this themselves and our team so talented that Rachel actually drew a lot of the birds in this book. Um, so we promoted it for Māori Language Week. This was a really huge success. Uh, we had over 10,000 unique page views in August and September and that came from social media promotion and Google. But by ensuring we didn't anchor the resource in a particular time, we're able to just, uh, when Māori Language Week is over, we just tweak the introduction to make sure that the content remains relevant. So we just took out the words celebrate Māori Language Week and the date and just changed it to celebrate Māori language. Um, very easy, simple fix. And that means that our content remains relevant for the, all the rest of the year until next year when we can then pop in the dates again and away we go. Hopefully we'll have like a star fax moment. So to recap, SEO is so worthwhile for us to invest in because we do the work once and we reap the benefits later. Social media, on the other hand, has a much higher churn. It's much harder to kind of keep it up. Um, it's a bigger risk and a bigger gamble. So in the last six months, we've really focused on using social media as a content marketing tool. And in the same way that media sites live and die by the front page, we see social media as kind of performing a very similar function. So that's where the audience lives uh, live 
What's helped drive this has been much more rigour around the planning and production of our content according to platform and the type of audience that exists there. We've also done some work around short URLs, so instead of using a bit.ly link, we always used Papa short URLs now, and we, we kind of have some fun with the URL and, and get a bit playful in terms of using that as a device to help tell the story in the same way that you would with a hashtag. Another much loved uh, um, device that newsrooms use is embedding social media into a story. So this is something that we've actually begun doing as well, and it adds like a real richness and a layer to the story. It gives us an opportunity to close the loop between our own social media accounts and platforms. Um, so here's an example of the Watercolour World project that Te Papa is part of, and a tweet from patrons Clarence House with their 70,000, um, 700,000 uh, followers are using one of our collection images. And then we were able to embed a further tweet from our rights manager, Victoria Leachman, saying, yay, thanks for using the image. So, just a little recap on uh, creating content. Whether we're building short burn content or whether we're building evergreen content, there are some golden rules. Understand the different pathways and the, and the way the audience arrives at content. That helps grow and maintain our audience. And by research, user demand and, and a deep understanding of analytics, this um, guides our experts towards content that is universally interesting. No talk would be complete about online journalism without talking about headlines and the art of writing a headline. Without a good headline, don't expect your audience to read the article. Um, recently someone told me that um, goldfish have a longer attention span than a person. It's, it's worth bearing in mind next time you kind of uh, scroll through your news feed at high speed. A headline is often the first point of contact with a user and it can very easily be the last if you haven't done a very good job. So my single piece of advice for great headline writing is don't be cryptic. It's very tempting to be cryptic mysterious or ambiguous in the hope that the user will click on it and see what it's about. But while clickbait is not okay, it's, it's okay to leave the user wanting more as long as it delivers what it promises. So you need to get that balance right. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about some examples of our digital content editors and our experts working together. So meet Rare Books Guy. Does anyone know Rare Books Guy? Is he here? No, yeah. So um, this is um, Martin Lewis. He's our research librarian. He, in a casual conversation, happened to mention to Rachel that um, there was uh, a lot of frequently asked questions that he had around the type of tiniest books, biggest books, etc., heaviest books. So voila, we have user demand right there. So he, with our help, wrote a blog um, and it became one of our most popular blogs of the year. But one of the great things about applying uh, a kind of journalistic lens onto creating stories is that it's actually, this was actually um, kind of surprising, but it's been great. <laughs> um, it means that uh, news organisations find it much easier to pick up our stories now and either rip off <laughs> or repurpose or kind of do a, their own version of the story. So Martin's story was picked up by News Hub and then their content partner MSN. Another one of Martin's blogs that we uh, worked with him on about mar uh, marbling. Uh, he was invited onto Radio New Zealand to talk about that. Um, and they even used our headline, which is awesome. So this is, uh, this is the one that's excited me the most because this happened like in the last two weeks. So we have this amazing story about um, a cave in Martinborough. And over thousands of years, hundreds of um, rare and, and, and extinct birds have fallen into this cave, and the cave has a load of bones in there. Um, moa, kakapo, kiwi, takahe. So sometimes the subject matter experts are actually just better at talking rather than writing. So we interviewed um, our expert, Alan Tennyson, and we wrote a story that was basically a news story. We toyed with the headline <coughs> Kakapo Death Pit, but then Daniel pointed out that it sounds like a bad 80s rock band. Um, so we backed off from that, which is kind of a shame actually, because um, next thing you know, 
the media have picked up the story and they're running with various versions of death pit, etc. So this story is just a really um, great example of how um, we put the work in and we structure stories in the right way, then media organisations can spot them a mile off. Um, I think that uh, this went actually out on the New Zealand Herald and then ran all their sister publications and then Stuff picked up the story and it went around all their publications, all their local rags around the country. We've also had um, Atlas Obscura do a version of this story and now apparently BBC are actually uh, making queries about this story. So. Our little measly uh, 1,600 unique page views on the blog has now blown out to uh, a further reach of um, 300,000 potential readers to the story. And I think this is great. I mean, I think this story actually is just a really good yarn. It's a dark cave. It's got drama. It's got birds. People love birds. It's bones. So um, this is... This is um, the kind of direction that we really want to take now because this really is worthwhile for us. And it really shows that we can actually use our own platforms to break stories. I mean, why not? Another um, example of how we can actually dock into sort of fast moving news stories while still grounding our content in our collections um, is that this example. So the day that um, John Clark, um, AKA Fred Dagg passed away, um, our, co our curator, Stephanie Gibson, wrote a really quick story about how she went over to Melbourne and to acquire his gumboots. So this um, meant that we could in uh, inject credible but unique content into a big story early enough to start appearing quite high in the searches in Google. So reacting fast is key here and, and um, it's probably not something that we're really used to doing but when we do it, it can really drive new users to the content. And no talk would be complete without the ultimate in timeliness, which is our live live stream. So we've done a couple of these recently. Um, this was used to great effect recently for our uh, Ronga Whakata um, opening profiti, streamed on YouTube and then uh, embedded into a web page and received thousands of views. We also um, streamed our kapahaka uh, on Facebook that reached 1.5 million people. Um, so this just gives you an idea of other ways that you can actually reach our non-visitor audience around the country, people who can't come here. So, to conclude, uh, yep, five minutes, good. Um, the work of the digital content team has meant the way we create and promote content and the way our audiences consume content is changing. We're building up a really great unique bank of original content that has the potential to gain rankings and SEO as well as employing strategies to, um, for more exposure and engagement through content marketing. This all adds up to more brand awareness and ultimately increased access for our users to our prize collections, stories and knowledge. Meaning we can connect our users with our past and present, whoever they are and wherever they are. Thank you. Kia ora. All right, we have time for questions, so if you do have any, please raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Kia ora, I'm Meredith from the Nelson Provincial Museum. Meredith. What's the interface between your team and your subject experts, the curators? Are they coming to you with content daily yeah. or are you hunting and, and chasing we, them down? A bit of both. Sometimes they'll come to us with an idea that we think, ah. but it's a balance because we don't want to put them off entirely. So we, we think of, you know, we give them suggestions and we work with them to, to make the most out of it, even though we kind of know in our heart of hearts it's not going to be a big hitter. Um, and then we just, it's just about having that conversation open with them all the time and providing feedback and suggestions and tips. So we actually, um, Rachel sends out a monthly um, top of the blogs newsletter. We have a little leaderboard. Um, so uh, the, the top blogger of the month gets a little gold star. It sounds kind of silly, but it actually works because they're, they're, you find that they're actually quite competitive. So um, yeah, so sometimes, you know, we're always got our ears open for story ideas. Um, and you know, we are a really small team. So sometimes we see stories that we, we can't possibly cover, but it's a little bit of both actually. Yeah, we have to keep the dialogue open. We'll get them to take us on just tours of the storeroom, which is yeah. great for us because we love going behind the scenes. And then they'll just tell us great stories, and we say, "Ah, that's what 
our audience is going to love. Yeah. So I think that's generally where the biggest story sometimes yeah. has come from is when we ask them to. And we have a tours. we have a camera in the team now too, so we just take a camera and you know take some photos, and we've got a story. Yeah. Um, hi, um, I'm interested um, from the perspective of how you develop, did you develop a strategy before you started? Because any of the change that's occurred from your previous, yeah. you know, I've seen a bit of a change in all those stories I'd seen. Mm. So I'd engaged yeah. with them myself personally. So obviously I, I've, I've sort of seen it the last year. Yeah. So I'm interested in that process. It was, it's a lot of um, trial and error. Uh, obviously, I'm telling you about this, the success stories today. <laughs> There's been a lot that haven't been successful. Um, but I think that it's, I mean, even though, you know, we're the digital content team and we're the experts in this field, we are always learning. And we're also always getting s surprised about audience. You know, we think we've got an audience segment cracked and then we do something and it, it flops or so we're it's been something that is is constantly evolving so this new kind of um, direction for us to actually do the interviews ourselves is brand new so that's kind of a bit of a uh, a change of direction for us so it's still it's an ongoing process I'd say yeah Hi, it's David Reeves from Auckland Museum. I was wondering if you have a marked difference in the uptake between uh, a, a blog or other article with still images versus something with video or moving images. Is, the, is there a really an appreciable difference in audience interest and uptake? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends, again, on where you promote it. Um, if it's going out on social media, then obviously a video is, social media is all about video now. So um, I, don't, I don't think we've done a comparison like for like because I think no stories are different so you know it depends on how we want to tell the story but I think for us we really need to be looking at how we can um, produce more video sh quicker shorter video that's more appropriate for particularly that social media audience so not the Google, the Google searchy audience but the social media audience yeah so it, de it depends yeah well, that brings us to the end of our time so um, please join me in thanking Michelle Thank you.